Who remembers Wizards 101? I'm gonna bet that it was probably a lot of you since now it's being recommended on Steam. For whatever reason, a free children's version of WoW on Steam. But, you know, we'll come back to that. Do you remember back in the mid to late 2000s and even up into the early 2010s when children's MMO games were all the rage for indie developers to release as their first quote-unquote big project? If you're unfamiliar with what an MMO is, or what WoW is, then here's a quick rundown. MMO stands for Massive Multiplayer Online, so one large server that every user logs into and plays together on, whether that's by completing quests, or... Got to sign in! Character name! Alright, I'm in! But Massive Multiplayer Online game is too long, so for the sake of time, I'm just gonna keep calling it an MMO. WoW, on the other hand, is one of the most popular MMO games of all time, the acronym, of course, standing for World of Warcraft. A children's MMO is exactly what you'd think, World of Warcraft, but aimed more towards children. Gone are the themes of death and, well, sadness, and instead have been replaced by cute anthropomorphic animal sidekicks and goofy characters and wacky adventures. There were a bunch of these games throughout my childhood specifically, ranging from Pop Tropica to Club Penguin. A few of these games have made money by having a subscription service like Club Penguin, uh, it's similar to what we have now with services such as PlayStation Plus or Xbox Live. These subscriptions were a monthly fee that attached to your account that allowed you to log into the game and play together. In 2005, a man named Eli Achillian formed a small game studio in Plano, Texas named King's Isle Entertainment, with the goal of producing games for his then teenage son to play. His first employees were former workers at the already established game studios such as id Software, known for the Doom games, and Ubisoft, known for all kinds of games ranging from Far Cry to Assassin's Creed. The names of the initial employees Achillian hired are unknown, but on April 25th, 2008, the company announced themselves to the public along with their debut project, Wizards 101. The company was comprised of employees from the previously mentioned studios, as well as David Nichols, who was previously the president of the now-defunct Midway Games. A quick side tangent about Midway Games, for those of you that may not know, was formerly Atari, until it was acquired by the Midway parent company, and then turned into an arcade cabinet manufacturer before eventually filing for bankruptcy on February 12, 2009. Their greatest hits include the Mortal Kombat series and the Fast and Furious arcade game. Alright, side tangent over, back to King's Isle. For Wizard 101, a man named Tom Hall, who was the former co-founder of id Software, served as the project's creative director. And it's hard to say if Wizards 101 or even King's Isle would still be around and active today without his oversight. If you don't believe me, I'll link the Wikipedia article in the description for those of you that might want to read it. Not all of you will, and especially not all of you will find it interesting, but anyone who worked alongside John Carmack is an interesting person to me. If you don't know who John Carmack is, I'll be happy to make him the subject of my next video. First, who was John Carmack? Well, he was obsessed with computers and playing video games, and at 14 years old, made fucking acid out of thermite and Vaseline to melt his school's windows to steal all of their computers. He got arrested, and a psychiatric evaluation found that he was, quote, a brain on legs with no empathy for other human beings. Wow, a brain on legs, Jesus Christ. Now this might sound like a fucked up thing to say about somebody, until you remember what Quake and Doom are like. In late 2008, Wizard 101 officially went public and was met with resounding praise. By the release of Pirate 101 in 2012, which I will get to, I swear, just give me a minute, Wizard 101 had a whopping 30 million active and registered users. By now, King's Isle had surpassed their initial employee count of 100, and had now turned that into 135, which led Achillian to lease an 18,000 square foot office space in Austin, Texas for the team to work out of. If you ask me, isn't too shabby for a children's video game studio. After the success of their first game, they did what every studio in Hollywood does and greenlit a sequel. This one set in the same universe as Wizard 101, The Spiral, only this one would mix the magic of Wizard 101 and the swashbuckling adventures of the highly popular and profitable Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. And of course, it also released to a resounding success. This is where I come in. I was maybe six or seven at the time and just so happened to love Pirates of the Caribbean, which my parents didn't show me, but of course the internet did, along with a lot of other things. I may not have had a computer at the time, but I did have an iPad. Yes, I was an iPad kid. I'll be reading those hate comments here in a bit. 
I discovered YouTube around this time, and subsequently gaming channels such as Stampy Long Nose and Iballistic Squid, as well as a lot of others, which eventually led me to finding out about Pirate 101. After a small amount of relentless begging, my dad finally let me download the game on his work laptop. And I was hooked, playing it every chance I got, and only dropping it when they got me my first Nintendo DS a few months later. I had to guess it was to stop me from hogging my dad's work computer so he could actually get something done. And after that, I forgot about the game almost immediately. Children's attention span, I guess. It popped up in my brain every now and then when I was bored or trying to fall asleep, only to go away again for another few months until it came back. As the years went on, I just assumed Pirate 101 went the way of most online games from that time, lost to history, and shut down after the company filed for bankruptcy or something. But I couldn't have been more wrong. The other day I was browsing Steam. See, I told you we'd come back to it. While browsing Steam for free and games that were on sale, I saw an ad for Wizard 101, the companion game to my beloved Pirate 101. I checked the Steam page to see if the game was still up and running, and after a quick Google search I found that Pirate 101 was still online as well. So of course the next logical step was to pester my friends to play it with me. Yo, 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 hey, would you play Pirate 101 with me for a little bit? Oh my gosh, bro, fuck off, no, Jeez. With that out of the way, let's play. The gameplay was super simple, as you would expect for a free kids game from 2012, but it still has its charm. All the characters are well voiced, and there was clearly a lot of love and care put behind this game. While textures and animation may be a bit rigid, there's nothing really wrong with them. In any other game, I would call this immersion breaking, but, I mean, come on. The game starts out with simple character creation section that I didn't record because I hadn't thought about making a video about it yet. Still having been swept up in nostalgia and curiosity as to how for some reason this game was still up and running almost 10 years after it released. Again, character creation was simple. Choose your gender, male or female. No extra alien genders had been invented by that point. Then you can choose, of all things, how your parents were killed. From the government to a kraken. Wonder where they got that idea from. Either way, after that, you choose your own clothing and hairstyle, before then choosing your pirate's clan seal and colors for your flag and your sidekick's clothing. After a cannonball flies through the wall of your cell, Boochbeard and his Napoleon parody of a sidekick instruct you to free a randomly generated animal sidekick from another cell. Mine was a Mongolian horse warrior. Either way, the sidekick is so grateful that you freed them from their cell, they devote their life to you and your crew on the spot and promise to stand by your side until the end. Once you make it to the top deck of the armada ship that you are imprisoned on, you are introduced to the combat mechanics that are just as, if not simpler, than the character creation. The turn-based combat system feels similar to that of the old-school Pokemon games, or more accurately, the Civilization games that my German teacher swears is fun. After the combat tutorial, Boochbeard is wounded, and you must commandeer his ship and fly through a barrage of cannon fire. Play the cannon fire clip. Now, you'll have time to learn that later, pirates! Keep oh my god, they just don't- the so How are they the reloading their cannons so fast? The game is so unrealistic. You fly the ship and dock it at Skull Island, where you are taken through another, slightly longer tutorial of interacting with objects and taking quests from NPCs. And after that, I really can't speak about the game. You go through a few more tutorial sections that are just as simple, and then you're left to your own devices. That's the beauty of the MMO medium to me. After the earliest section, how and what you play is all up to you. If you enjoyed this video, or if it inspired you to create a Pirate or Wizard 101 account, please leave a like. By the time this video goes up, if it goes up on time, my last video essay will have been released exactly a year ago. Man, it does not feel like that long, but either way, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see y'all next time.